Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Ed Silverman. I'm a senior writer and farm, farm law columnist at Stat News. I'm also today's moderator. Thank you for joining us. Today we're going to talk about the 21st Century Cures Act, which is a sweeping law that takes on numerous healthcare areas. And we're focusing on two of those areas in particular, the drug approval process and medical research funding. And this event is presented jointly, by the way, with Stat News and is streaming live on the websites of both the forum and statnews.com and also on Facebook. So we have very interesting panelists today, starting from my immediate right, Aaron Kesselheim, who's the Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and is also the Director of the Program on Regulation, Therapeutics, and Law. Next to him is Pamela Tenarts, Executive Director at the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative. Then there's Jeffrey Jason, Editor-in-Chief of the New England Journal of Medicine, and Otis Brawley, the Chief Medical Officer at the American Cancer Society. Uh, the program will include a brief Q&A, so start thinking of your questions now. And you can also email questions to the forum, that's one word, the forum at HSPH, as in Harvard School of Public Health, hsph.harvard.edu. And you can also participate in the live chat that's happening on the forum site right now. So what is the Cures Act? A bipartisan effort that was signed by President Obama this past December. Before we continue, though, let's take a quick look at some of the hopes for the act based upon what President Obama said at the signing ceremony. We're joined by a whole bunch of members of Congress here today, and it is wonderful to see how well uh, Democrats and Republicans uh, in the closing days of this Congress came together around a common cause. And I think it indicates the power uh, of this issue uh, and how deeply it touches uh, every family uh, across America. So I started uh, the 2016 State of the Union address by saying we might be able to surprise some cynics and deliver bipartisan action on the opioid epidemic. And in that same speech, I put Joe in charge of mission control on a new cancer moonshot. And today, with the 21st Century Cures Act, we are making good on both of those efforts. We are bringing to reality uh, the possibility of new breakthroughs to some of the greatest health challenges of our time. So Aaron, could you tell us a little bit more about the details of the Cures Act, <coughs> and particularly, what is it designed to do exactly? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this. It's uh, great to be part of this uh, esteemed panel. So the, the 21st Century Cures Bill is a 824-page uh, statute. Um, it, uh, and one of the common causes that, that people rallied around was increased funding for, uh, for the NIH, where um, a substantial amount of our most transformative uh, treatments and cures end up coming from through the NIH and through um, academic research uh, and government research labs that it funds. And so the, the Cures Act increased the NIH budget about 3% per year over the next three years, um, and as well also allocated an additional, on average, about $500 million per year over the next 10 years. Um, uh, although, and, and this is important because the NIH budget had been uh, decreasing over the last decade and a half in inflation adjusted dollars by about 22%. Um, now, the, the bill didn't um, formally allocate this money. All it did was authorize it, and each year the money is going to have to be included in a budget. And so there are no guarantees that any of this money will come through. But if it does, I think this will be a great uh, and, and important uh, advance in, in uh, helping fund research that will lead to the cures that we'll, that we'll get tomorrow. Um, a more controversial section of the bill related to the FDA and the rules for drug approval. Um, numerous controversial sections um, reduce the amount and the rigor of the clinical testing that are required before a drug is, is needs to be approved for use. And this is based on a, a, what is a foundational misconception that the FDA standards are too demanding and they keep valuable treatments away from patients and needlessly increase the cost of drug development. And this just isn't true. Um, so for example, there's one section of the bill that directs the FDA, I'm sorry, the Secretary of HHS to qualify new drug development tools 
which is sort of a euphemism for a biomarker or surrogate measure. Um, but, um, you know, for example, scientific merit isn't even a required component of this drug development tool <coughs> certification. There are other parts of the bill that facilitate submission of patient experience data, um, which is a euphemism for patient anecdotes um, for use in drug approval, and, and, and other, other parts of the bill. You know, in fact, the FDA already uses all of these tools um, in, in evaluating products, but the bill pushes the FDA, I think, in, in some sections to go beyond what is scientifically um, and currently reasonable uh, for these options. There are other changes as well. For example, the FDA prides itself on analyzing the underlying data for all the applications that it receives, and one part of the bill tells the FDA to approve new medications on the basis of the manufacturer-generated data summaries only. There's another part of the bill that provides uh, approvals for new antibiotics, a, a pathway based on, on very limited data, uh, of speeding of approval of new devices based on limited data. So I just want to make clear that no section of the bill formally changes any of the basic FDA requirements on efficacy and safety, but many, many parts of, these, of this part of the bill o o overemphasize um, speed over science and the reliance on less rigorous data to meet those standards, and, and that's what's made this part of the bill particularly controversial. Thank you. So Pam, um, CTTI was co-founded by the FTA, by the way, which I think um, is an interesting insight. So what's your take on the, on the, on the law now? Um, so yes, uh, the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative was co-founded by Duke and the FDA, and actually Rob Califf, who's the uh, immediate past <coughs> commissioner, was part of the creation of City as well. And I agree with Aaron that there is a misconception that FDA is the bottleneck, and, and fixing or streamlining things that FDA will magically fix um, everything and will get pati uh, patients' treatments faster. That is just not true. Um, clinical drug development takes over 10 years, and it's only the latter portion of that 10 years that's where it's sort of at FDA. The FDA doesn't take 10 years, obviously, to, to approve anything. People are working on things, and then when it gets to FDA, it probably takes a year, two, year and a half to get things approved on average. Um, and by the way, only about 12% of treatments that actually start in drug development make it to an approval. So and it's not <laughs> FDA being the only bottleneck. It's many things like the drugs don't make it in efficacy or they don't show a, a beneficial safety profile. So there's other things at play. Having said that, I don't think there's anything in the Cures Act that directs FDA to, recu uh, to reduce or lower their evidentiary st uh, standards. They're not asked to approve drugs on a different level of standards as they have in the past. Um, what it does is set some, in my opinion, some statutory guidance around some of the things that have already been, been going on, which is things like in introducing and including the patient experience and uh, real world evidence. And by the way, some of this work is actually very closely aligned with what is coming out with PDUFA 6 as well. Um, and the act, I think, encourages the FDA to consider pieces of information during the approval process that, are, that actually might be helpful and gives a little bit of a, of a way to, to think about that. So we talked, uh, Aaron talked about the patient um, focused drug development that's included in, in the act right now. And really what that does is it allows the FDA to um, take the patient experience into account a little bit more than what it has in the past. Um, there's actually something in there that um, remove some of the Paper Act reduction provisions that, that allow that um, FDA is not allowed to meet with more than 10 people of a certain group at the same time, and it removes that aspect so that they can talk to patients and ask patients about how they experience diseases, what would be improvement to them, and I actually think that that is valuable, and putting some science behind that is, so, is sort of where this uh, act is going. Um, advancing um, Including real-world evidence, I think, is also an important part. And again, FDA is already listening to some of that, but one of the downsides, <laughs> clinical trials are the gold standard for approving anything. What that, the limitation, though, is that it's in a very specified environment, and the extrapolation to the real world is sometimes not always very easily done. And, and including some of that real-world evidence earlier and putting some scientific boundaries in around that is probably not a, not a bad thing. Um, the other thing it does is I think we all rely on expertise and um, scientific expertise at the FDA to do their job well. And the Cures Act does allow for um, some 
strengthening that expertise and creating some additional provisions for them to be able to hire clinical, scientific, and technical people to do the job at FDA. And so it creates some uh, provisions for allowing them to hire more people and, and hiring the right people um, at the same time. It also allows for them, and NIH as well, to have a, a little bit easier way of getting to meetings and conventions where there's a lot of you know, scientific dialogue and collaboration that can happen to advance the field uh, together. Um, one other thing, the other things it's done is it's created, it's kind of, FDA is currently organizing centers, of, you know, drug is separate from devices, and for oncology, and I'm sure you'll talk about that, there's a new center created that kind of transcends people looking at just drugs or just devices and really looking at a disease and how all those things can help uh, bring that, bring uh, benefit to patients with that disease. So not just having the device people looking at devices for cancer and the drug people over here looking at drugs, but bringing everything together so that they can look at, at that as a whole. Um, and I'll well, thank you. Jeff, we've heard a little bit about funding issues, but more specifically, could you tell us a little bit about how the NIH funding may be affected by the law? So uh, the NIH is the largest funder of research, medical research, in the world. And by way of full disclosure, I'm an NIH grantee. Uh, so I have, uh, since the 70s, uh, run a lab off of NIH money. And it's a hard row to hoe. It really is. Uh, but it's one that has provided the information that's allowed the FDA to have new drugs to approve. Uh, through the world, the FDA and other organizations acknowledge that it is U.S.-funded NIH research that's driven most of the basic discovery that we've seen. So for years now, uh, the NIH has been undergoing a slow strangulation. Uh, the amount of dollars being put into the FDA hasn't gone up. Inflation has diminished their value. Uh, and it's been tough for researchers, somebody who wants to do research for a living, to stay funded because that's the only way you can get any new information is to have the resources it takes to do the research. So the bill does a lot of things, but one of the key things that it does is it says that there will be more money for certain areas. But as you mentioned, it said the bill says thou, thou shalt be more money but it doesn't say the money's actually coming. So that they have to get the budget through Congress for the next 10 years. If they're successful, it will be wonderful because we have new initiatives in addition to supporting the basic NIH budget. My work has been in heart, lung, and blood. I'm basically a lung researcher. And there isn't a lot of money specifically earmarked for that, but there is money earmarked for new ideas. And the three or four key areas are the brain. Mr. Obama was a very a strong proponent of the brain initiative to have better ideas for neuroscience. I teach a first year class uh, from cross registration between MIT and Harvard Medical School. And those really bright kids, almost half of them want to do neuroscience research. So we have a lot of really smart people that want to do this. We're looking for the money to support it. Now, in the next 10 years, $1.5 billion is going to be added to that if this appropriation comes through. Now, one of the problems with it is that the amount of money per year goes up and down. It's $10 million this year, which isn't much. It's really only one or two big grants. But in 2023, it's $450 million. But then it drops back. So the funding, you know, we're not complaining about the ups and downs as long as they're there, but it does go up and down a lot. And F, uh, NIH administrators, if they're smart, should be able to even it out. But there is a concern that their uh, money won't be appropriated and that it goes up and down. The Precision Medicine Initiative, the idea to advance our therapeutics by getting a better idea of who we're treating for what, when, and by what means, to use something other than clinical judgment, specific molecular markers, to gather the information that will tell me that Aaron will benefit from this treatment 
Pam will benefit from another, even though they might have the same disease. And that precision medicine initiative is something that's been on a lot of people's mind. It's been hard to reduce to practice, to make it work. And this money should be able to help make that work. Joe Biden's cancer moonshot. This is actually, a, I'd say, almost like precision medicine in cancer. But the cancer people have fortunately been ahead of lots of other areas of medicine. Uh, they've gone from looking at cancers under the microscope to looking at cancers molecularly and using that information to make treatment decisions. And with that change in how they thought and having new drugs that came from NIH research, they've been able to make a huge difference. And we're gonna see a short video about somebody whose life has been changed by that kind of research. And then there's $30 million, and that really only comes over the next four years, for regenerative medicine. Uh, this is the use of stem cells and other therapies to take diseases that we thought were totally untreatable, spinal cord injury, certain other dysfunctions where we think the body has involuted and never is gonna come back. Can we regenerate it? It sounds a little space age-ish, but the money can be there. Money is what drives research because you need the resources when you have an idea. So those are the two key components, ideas and money. We have lots of people with ideas, but they're only gonna stay in the system if there's money to support them. This bill suggests the money will be there, but doesn't prove the money's gonna be there. Thanks, Jeff. It was very good insight. Um, so, and as Jeff mentioned, one of the areas that's expected to receive large funding is cancer. So let's take a look at another clip, courtesy of FASTA Cures, which is a center at the Milken Institute of a young mother who's been diagnosed with cancer. We found out that I, that I had the stage four melanoma the day before I was supposed to go back to work for maternity leave. So Kai was three months when we started this and definitely the most difficult part emotionally is worrying about not being there for him. One of the most surprising things that I have found in talking to other people is how many people have told me that their oncologist told them that there's nothing that they could do, that they have weeks to months to live, get their things in order. I mean, these are people's lives. It's your whole life. It, it changes in one, in one instant. There has to be options. I decided to write this blog to document my experience on the National Cancer Institute's TILL trial. Because of this trial, I am confident that I will see my son grow up. And even more importantly, I am confident that my son will have a mother. We cannot be satisfied with things that work okay. That can't be the goal. There's life-threatening illnesses um, you know, and we need to be working at ways to find cures for them, not just several treatments that may or may not work. It's important to remember what it is that you're doing, what the end goal is. The end thing that you're doing is potentially saving somebody's life. So, Otis, we've uh, heard about different aspects of the Cures Act, uh, but how might it impact cancer research specifically? Yeah. Well, Vice President Biden uh, started his moonshot, and as a result, part of the Cures Act has what's called the Bo Biden Cancer Moonshot. It's named after the Vice President's son who died of a brain tumor. And it actually authorizes uh, $1.8 billion over the next 10 years for cancer research. Uh, it authorizes, it doesn't appropriate as the other uh, panelists have uh, described. So we hope that money arrives. It also gives the FDA a half a billion dollars over the next 10 years to establish an oncology center. And that center 
uh, has some uh, new rules that they're going to be working under, different from previous rules. And that those new rules uh, partially reflect the fact that uh, the National Cancer Act, uh, which was passed in 1971, which uh, Ted Kennedy referred to as Richard Nixon declaring war on cancer, has borne a great deal of fruit in terms of our understanding of carcinogenesis and our understanding of actually what cancer is at a molecular level. So much so that when I graduated from medical school in the mid-1980s, lung cancer was really two diseases, non-small cell lung cancer and small cell lung cancer. And that's really what we as clinicians had to deal with. Uh, over the next few years, uh, uh, lung cancer started becoming more and more diseases and now using precision medicine, probing the gene, looking at what genes are mutated or what things within the cell has gone haywire to make it cancerous. Uh, lung cancer is now thought of as 80 different diseases. And it'll probably be more in the next year or two. And that, what that means is uh, when I did a lung cancer clinical trial, the CFA drug worked in the early 1990s. I needed to put 200 people with non-small cell lung cancer onto the clinical trial to see if there were 15 to 20 percent who benefited from the drug and I could get that drug uh, FDA approved. Actually, that's how Taxol was FDA approved, and the numbers actually work out there. Now, I need to find people with one of these 80 kinds of lung cancer and test a drug that I think is very specific to that problem in that lung cancer. So we've turned lung cancer into a series of orphan diseases and we can no longer do these two 300 person trials. The FDA, can now look at 15 and 20 person trials and actually uh, approve drugs based on that. But that gives us the problem that some of our rigor, some of our scientific certainty that the drug is beneficial goes away because we tested it on so few people. So aftermarket studies are going to be incredibly important. We're also going to have to uh, come to grips with the fact that we may approve a drug and it may be out on the market for five or six years and we decide the drug really is not as good as we initially thought it was and we may have to rescind the approval. So uh, while I'm very supportive of the 21st Century Cures Act, uh, I, I think that there are some pluses and minuses to it. It, after all, is a, a political compromise, not just between Republicans and Democrats, but within medicine, you have people who are a little bit more conservative and a little bit more liberal, people who would like to get drugs to people faster and people who would really like to be very rigorous and research those drugs. And this is really a compromise. What are your concerns, Otis, about the impact of the, the, the regulatory decision-making process with some of the uncertainty surrounding the FDA at, at the moment? Is there anything in particular that we ought to be clued in as, as the uh, administration plays out here? Well, I actually look at the current FDA and see some very wise people there who have uh, a whole track record of making what I would call good decisions. Uh, one of my friends actually referred to the FDA as the federal damned if you do, damned if you don't agency. You're in trouble if you don't approve a drug. You're in trouble if you do approve a drug. I think those folks have walked a very fine tightrope. And I think that the 21st Century Cures Act gives the group of people who are at the FDA right now the right leeway to continue making those decisions. I actually worry a little bit about the 21st Century Cures Act with a group of people staffing the FDA who are not as wise as the people who I trust now. And I'd also add one thing the 21st Century Cures Act doesn't talk enough about in my mind is prevention of disease. In my world of cancer, uh, certainly 30 percent and probably 50 to 60 percent of cancers can be prevented and it's better to actually prevent these things than actually have to find a treatment to try to cure these diseases. Uh, the 21st Century Cures Act mentions cancer prevention a little bit, but then it actually guts uh, something from the Affordable Care Act and that is the Prevention and Public Health Fund, which was funding a lot of prevention activities from the CDC. Hmm. Jeff, I have a couple of questions for you. First is, you mentioned before that the potential funding 
would be would fluctuate from year to year. Could you just tell us a little bit more why that could be a concern, and um, if it is a concern, what are the specific negative implications down the road? So uh, during the lean years, uh, you have a very small research group, and uh, you have an idea, but there's nobody there to work on it. And then you have a fat year. You have a lot of money. You bring on people. They start working on these ideas. They're just beginning to really make sense, and the funding stops. And those folks that were on the edge, just about to really make a difference, have to find another job because the money isn't there to support them. Now, what I don't know whether the details allow uh, an NIH administrator to take this money and smooth it out over time. So when there is an extra $300 million in the budget, can they award five-year grants and put that out over, six, over five or six years and make, make the amount of money less but the funding longer? One of the things that is a problem in research is that you need continuity. You need continuity at the basic science level so people don't do the same experiments over and over again. When you get to the level where you have an idea that's progressed to clinical trials, you need a network that exists so you don't have to build a trial network every time you want to do a study. It's a total waste of time and money. Uh, so that if you're going to keep that network going so that when a new drug comes along or a new diagnostic or a new non-drug therapeutic comes along, the uh, administrative underbelly is there so you can test it quickly. I think that one of the questions that we're, we're going to be defending or having to grapple with is uh, if you treat 100 people with something, there are going to be a couple of people who do terrifically and some people who do terribly. So can we identify something about those people who do terrifically so we can find more of them? <coughs> or in fact, aren't we gonna, are we not going to be smart enough to do that? And are we just looking at random variation? Um, we have to deal with this kind of uncertainty all the time. Having the money there allows people to build research programs that are robust and can deal with variance. One of my professors here at the School of Public Health used to say that one man's noise is another man's signal, right? And the noise in a cancer trial are the people who don't get better, or the people who do dr dramatically well. And what we hope this initiative will allow is for people to figure out who does well and who does poorly in advance. So I don't treat you while I treat you with the same disease. And you have a good outcome and you're spared the toxicity while we look for a new drug for you. But, as you said, continuity is important, and we don't have a guarantee of continuous funding. So, realistically, what do you think we can expect from research pipelines going forward? It, it, so it seems very, very unclear, and maybe very little happens. So, I've been an NIH investigator since 1972, and I can tell you that there was never a guarantee of funding. It's a, a competition of the best ideas. The problem is when the best ideas don't get funded, then we're in trouble. And so that we want competition. We want people to have to fight for their money, but we want there to be some money to fight for. And it's getting that balance right uh, that we hope can come out of this bill um, because otherwise people quit and they go into some other line of work. I'd like to uh, move on to some of the issues concerning, thank you, Jeff. I'd like to move on to some of the issues concerning um, the approval process. One of the, the um, I guess, issues that doesn't seem to be fully addressed to any extent in the law is um, a mechanism to ensure safety and how that um, could actually, and why there's a need for that, and what, is, what are the implications uh, if, if it is it, because it's not really there, it doesn't specify um, how to make sure that this shifting gears for allowing evidence for an additional use of an existing and approved drug uh, will then play out in the real world. So, um, Pam, I'd first like to ask you um, what, what you think of that and what's needed uh, to compensate if it's not in the law. Can, it, can there be compensation for that? 
So I think uh, one of the things you need to keep in mind is to realize if something is safe takes as much as to realize whether something works or not. So you need to have good clinical trials to have that evidence to know one or the other. Uh, and again, 92% of drugs that don't make it to final approval, they don't make it because of safety issues and efficacy issues. So when things are accelerated and um, drugs or treatments are approved with less numbers, you have to keep in mind that that's a different kind of approval than when they are approved with regular clinical trials. And I think at that point, it becomes a discussion for the provider with their patients uh, to sort of talk about that and talk a little bit about the risk tolerance of individual patients, whether they want to take those supposedly unknowns with the, with the upswing of a potential treatment that has shown benefit in a smaller group or whether that's not for them. But So that, that needs to be kept in, in line and, and sort of understood because safety is not a guarantee. Not every, not, drugs are just not always safe. There's always potential downsides. Uh, so I think for safety, the normal standards, evidentiary standards, need to be maintained. And if something is approved accelerated, then obviously more trials we need to be done on the back end to look at efficacy just as well as safety and potentially retract some things if maybe they're not found to be as safe because smaller numbers are going to come with more unknowns and that just needs to be taken into, into account. If I may, I, I totally agree with you. I also think we need to be very careful when we talk about efficacy. One of the things about this bill that actually rattles me just a little bit is that word cures. You know, in, in oncology, we usually say cure is a four-letter word. Uh, many of the drugs in oncology who have been, that have been FDA approved over the last 10, 20, 30 years have been FDA approved because they increase median life expectancy of people with stage four cancer by three or four months. Actually, the number that have been FDA approved that increase median life expectancy by more than six months, I can count on one hand. So we need to actually start uh, making people aware of what efficacy really is right. and, not, and not, uh, not make them think that we have uh, better treatments than we actually have. We have treatments that are useful, worthwhile, should be used, uh, but uh, the research still needs to be done to get even better treatments with uh, longer life expectancy or longer median survivals. And the other thing I'd say is the efficacy, th these accelerated pathways for approval, they're not for like nail fungus, you know, they're not for just anything. They are for diseases that are severe and where there's not many treatments available. And it's really about giving people options that are just not as known. And some of what efficacy means is exactly what you're talking about. It's not always, you're not gonna get cured. It's, you know, it's improvement. And that improvement needs to be subs you know, substantiated down the line. I would say that they should be for drugs that are not for nail fungus, but in actuality, <laughs> about two thirds of drugs now are approved on one accelerated pathway or another. So it does seem like that the way that these current pathways are being applied is that they're being applied well beyond these, um, you know, last case, you know, sort of scenarios for patients meeting unmet medical need. And so I think that we should really look at how many more of these accelerated pathways we need if already you know, over two-thirds of the drugs are being approved via one accelerated pathway or another. I'm wondering if we're not getting near the proverbial slippery slope. So, Otis, you mentioned before perhaps at some point maybe an approval will be, uh, need to be rescinded. Um, and we think about um, the, the different pathways. There's a focus on some of the discussions been on, on the more serious diseases, forms of cancer, but as you just mentioned, there are other drugs for other illnesses, maladies, that are also um, being pursued. And this law actually does not single out any one particular therapeutic category. So I'm wondering, how do we avoid getting into a scenario where the public gets its hopes up? We've got this new law. It's going to be, hopefully, going to be funded. It's going to make it more, more likely, more possible that we'll see additional approvals for drugs that already we know already work for something, and we have additional evidence that will show it can be just as good for disease A and, and disease B. But later, gee, it's not really what we thought. And how do we, how do we avoid, as, as, 
how's the medical community and the policy folks, how do we avoid looking at a scenario where uh, folks feel they've been sold a, 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 some might say snake oil, but they, they've been sold a, a, a bill that really isn't what it meant is meant to be. How do we avoid sliding down there? And it, does this law take us there unless we have additional safeguards? Is it, or are we looking at a case where perhaps this is more prudent? Again, context of not knowing what the new administration will do with the FDA. I'm asking a lot of questions here, but I'm trying to get uh, I'm, I'm trying to get some insight as to because the public, the average person isn't going to know a lot about this law or some of the points raised here. They'll only know they're either going to get a drug that's going to help them or not. But gee, maybe if it doesn't work out, why is that? Why did that happen? How do we prevent that from happening? Well, I, if I can, I think that our expectations are sometimes raised just a way little <coughs> too much that, we've, that we think we're going to get more <laughs> out of medicine than we actually should. Now this, this law I think is actually a very good one, the 21st Century Cures Act. I actually think even though it's a political compromise and it's a compromise amongst the clinical trialists, the conservatives and the liberals in clinical trial methodology, which is not political, it's a scientific philosophical argument. I think this is a good bill, but the hard work starts after the bill is passed. The hard work does not end once the president signs the bill. It's up to us to keep the scientific standards high. It's up to us to explain what reasonable endpoints and what reasonable things can come out of these drugs that are in development or these drugs that are up for FDA approval. Uh, and so a lot of explaining, things like this show, need to go on. So I, I think a lot of the problem is that under our current way of doing business, FDA approval is an unbridled license to market. And anybody that has watched television, especially in the 6 to 8 o'clock time frame, can find a drug to treat almost anything very creative ads that make it seem like we have what you want. It's a big, there's a lot of money involved here. When uh, uh, the FDA decided to withdraw an indication for a marketed cancer drug, the company brought all sorts of people who claimed their life was being saved by this and that if they withdrew the indication, the insurance company would take away their support and it would be terrible. So we have to figure out uh, what the risks and benefits are. I mean, we learned a lot from the HIV epidemic. Their people were facing a disease that in the late 80s, early 90s, was gonna kill them in six months or less. And they were willing to take all sorts of risks on the safety side for the efficacy. And we, we learned from that, that people were willing to take these risks and new drugs came out of that pipeline and we've turned HIV AIDS from an illness that would kill you in six months to a manageable illness for many decades. Well, same thing's happening with cancer now. Cancer isn't being cured, as Otis has said. We're turning it into a manageable disease. And so we're making a lot of money for drug companies and we're extending people's lives. Uh, and so we have to work this balance. And if your life is being extended by a drug that turns out, when given to large numbers of people, has a side effect that you might not want because of your disease, then you're going to have to make that decision. And I'm going to make a different decision if I'm taking a drug for a cancer that's going to kill me in the next year than if I'm taking a drug for headache or toenail fungus, although toenail fungus can be pretty bad. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we, we, we need to work out a way and we need to have a way to connect with the public because we allow the drug companies to connect with the public in an unbridled fashion now. I mean, it's not unbridled. There's the division of drug uh, marketing at the FDA. They have to approve those advertisements so they're not misleading. But they certainly suggest that people with almost any condition are going to improve from therapy. Now, we publish articles all the time that says a drug works. No treatment, 80% of people either die or have progression. You now have a new drug on the market instead of 80% of people dying and, and have progression. A really powerful drug would be one where that number was 
right? So that still have you're not. That doesn't mean that everybody that gets a drug is going to get better. Yeah. So that we have to understand that the treatments we have uh, really just change the odds of getting better. There are very few things. The treatment for hepatitis C is one of those exceptions. And we don't, you know, that we keep on bringing it up because it is such a powerful exception. If you treat 100 people with a drug for hepatitis C in the 1990s, you couldn't cure anybody. You treated them in the year 2005 to 2010, you'd cure half people with a therapy that took over a year and made you feel like dirt. Now we have a drug that will treat you in eight to 10 weeks and cures 99% of people. That's an infectious disease, a big advance, and it's a rare event. We don't have it for everything else. And it's based on, it's, you know, of course, the, the sort of underlying technology there and the underlying discoveries there were based on, fundamentally based on uh, investments by government-funded science at, in, at Emory and in other places that helped uh, in, in lead to those discoveries. And so, you know, that's why those parts of that bill, I think, are so important. Yeah, now you brought up a very interesting point. And by the way, I'm hoping that a lot of uh, cancers will be converted to the diabetes model of pe treating people who have a disease and they will live long. HIV is very much that way now. We do have some cancers where that works, but the drug you were talking about is a vastin for metastatic breast cancer. Uh, and it brings up the question of surrogate markers. Avastin was FDA approved on an expedited basis because in a large clinical trial, it extended progression-free survival versus women who were treated with the old therapy. And so it was FDA approved because these women had, they were free of disease for a longer period of time. Now, once it was FDA approved, everybody started using it. And about four to five years into the approval, they looked at that old clinical trial and they noted that yes, women had longer progression-free survival. They did not have longer overall survival. And indeed, some of the women who were treated with Avastin actually died of Avastin toxicities. And so the FDA removed the drug from the market Women who were benefiting from Avastin showed up who to protest, they were who thought they were, yes, that's important. Women who thought they were benefiting from Avastin showed up to protest. Uh, I would point out the women who died from Avastin did not show up to protest. <laughs> And it was, it was a huge, it was a very difficult time for the FDA. It was a very, very difficult time for the FDA. Now the new Cures Act is going to set up that same type of situation and it's going to happen even more. That's one example of it happening in the last 15 years. It's probably going to happen every couple of years in medical oncology at least because of the 21st Century Cures Act. We need to be ready to accept that. This is a good time to break through some questions. Thank you, Ed. Thanks. Um, okay, let's start with this one. I'm very connected to the rare disease community, and there's a lot of disappointment in the act because the open clause was dropped, which would have incentivized the drug companies to invest in treatments for orphan diseases that involved costly trials. Are there any other provisions in the act that might compensate for this or help those with rare disorders that are not cancer-related? So um, there are uh, so a number of parts of the bill. So the FDA, uh, there are a lot of drugs that are already approved for rare diseases, and the FDA uses substantial flexibility in the case of approvals for those products, and and can you know take into account the fact that these are rare conditions and they are necessarily going to be treated in fewer patients, um, and uh, they're going to have to be some. Um, you know, some compromises made in the types of data that they're going to be collecting. And so the FDA already uses those kinds of flexibilities. And I think that the, um, the 21st century cures bill, um, you know, potentially, you know, keeps those flexibilities open. Um, there is uh, one particular part of the bill that, in, in, that sort of encourages the FDA to approve drugs for rare diseases on the basis of uh, surrogate measures that are already used in the approval of other drugs for rare diseases and uh, and and actually the bill uh, tells the FDA to maximize the use of surrogate measures in those conditions and I do think that there are risks in those circumstances because when we're looking at a surrogate measure we're not looking at a measure of of patient improvement and we're not looking at a measure of, of symptoms 
um, we're looking at, at a blood test or something like that that may not be adequately validated. And so there's going to be, a, I think there are, uh, I think that that is, uh, it is an important downside of that part as well. Um, in terms of the open provision itself, which would have given manufacturers um, a six month extension in their market exclusivity um, for conducting a trial in rare diseases, we actually did a study um, published in Health Affairs in January um, showing that the uh, amount of, uh, of financial gain that that uh, provision would have given in many cases far exceeded the costs of doing trials in those, in those conditions. And uh, fortunately, there are still trials that are done and, and supplemental approvals that are done uh, you know, even without that, that additional incentive in place. So I'm not sure that incentive is that great of, a, is that great of an idea, but I do want to reassure whoever asked that question that the FDA does use substantial flexibilities when it comes to approving new uh, uh, drugs for, for rare diseases and that the, uh, the 21st Century Cures Bill keeps those flexibilities um, alive and well. Great, thank you, thank you. Let's do one more and then we'll see if our studio audience has a question. Um, how might a new FDA administration interpret and implement this act given Trump's executive order directing federal agencies to cut two regulations for every new one adopted, one in, two out? And how will this be managed if there is to be no increase in budget, according to the executive order, for implementing new regulations added or cut? How is the FDA actually going to make this work? So I'll, I'll take a stab at that. And that's not the only executive order that's actually having an effect on how the FDA works at the moment, because the, the freeze, the hiring freeze, is directly affecting how FDA is able to even maintain uh, their workload. They, they already started with over 500 open positions that were unfilled. Um, so. They're definitely going to have to look at that, and I think there's some there's study ongoing to see which one of the regulations are affected by that order. It's unclear because that's the other. It's unclear how if it's every regulation, if guidances count, all those things. So I think, in general, while people think there's a lot of regulation going on at FDA and some decrease might be beneficial, I think it's unsure how that's exactly going to work. As with anything and any new administration, there's always a little bit of uncertainty as to how things are implemented when there's a law, there's always room for in inter interpretation. I think um, some think that with this administration that uncertainty is even greater and you can, as long as we have somebody who can think thoughtfully about evidence and how these things should be approached, I think we're good. So that's, that's what I'm hoping for. <laughs> Great, thank you, thank you. Does anyone in the audience have a question? So many of the new cancer medicines have been approved on the basis of overall response rate. Uh, I understand that overall response rate has been shown to be associated with progression-free survival, which is in turn a surrogate for overall survival or clinical benefit. So my question is, given that that is, to me sounds like it's two levels removed from something that's patient relevant, uh, is overall survival uh, a good measure? Uh, what are your thoughts on overall uh, I am very worried about overall some rate. of the surrogates that are being used for overall survival. Uh, the prog I just gave you one where progression-free survival ended up not correlating with overall survival. Uh, we also, by the way, have some of the melanoma drugs, some of the new immunotherapies, where progression-free survival actually uh, is an inverse to overall survival. The people who have the shortest progression-free survivals live the longest. Um, and so valid validating these surrogate markers, I think, is incredibly important. The validation is going to depend both on the disease and the biology of the disease, as well as the type of drug one is using. And you know, it's no, we're, we have gone past the very simple world that I came into oncology in in the late 1980s, where we thought if we give the drug and the tumor shrinks, the patient lives longer. That doesn't exist anymore. I think another issue that really speaks to this question is that there's so many more choices now. It used to be that you had a drug, and if you failed, there wasn't any anything else. And if you had a rapidly progressive cancer, right. you were going to die. Now uh, you're, you have breast cancer, and it's progressing, and you enter a trial, and you flunk the trial because you had disease progression. You go on to another trial. 
into another trial, into another trial. And I have some, some dear friends who managed to, to live 10 or 12 years that way and to see their kids from adolescence through college. But it was not the drug that was making a difference. When that one failed, the next one had to fail, and the next one failed before they met the overall survival test. And so it's a difficult question to really answer cleanly because uh, you, we must have patients the opportunity when something fails to try something else. Otherwise, no one would enroll in a trial, right? You don't want to be locked in. The drug, drug doesn't work, you're going to die. No one would join such a trial. So we need to keep that faith there. We need to be uh, able to understand that overall survival is important. Progression-free survival is another area. We probably need to have better ways of measuring progression. That's right. We're not just using uh, the so-called resist criteria, which are basically looking at tumor size. And I think that what happens with a lot of the immunotherapy agents is as your immune system revs up, it makes that set of criteria look as if you're not doing well, when in fact what you're watching is the troops uh, marshalling for the attack not the cancer getting worse. Inflammation and, makes the tumor actually grow bigger. And the thing that looks like the tumor grow bigger. That's right. right? That's right. And, and, and they get better. So it's, it's not easy. And I think that uh, Pam was right. If we have thoughtful people at the FDA who don't have rules that you must follow these rules no matter what, but they look to see what's happening. And our goal is all the same. We want to find therapies, we want to find diagnostics that make people's lives better. And that ought to be our goal, and we have to figure out how to do it. And the FDA, I believe, is working with the same set of rules. We just have to figure out where to draw the line when we give drug approvals. And I think one of the key things that we need to do that's not in this bill <clears throat> is that we need to somehow keep the expectations lower. Right? You know, 10 years ago, how many cancer drugs were advertised on television. None. Right? And now there are cancer drugs advertised on television all the time. They're building expectation that we can't meet. The other thing I think that plays into that is sort of the patient experience and how that sort of thing, how, how that changes how you think about what is a good thing for a patient and what isn't. Mm -hmm. And so cancer-free survival may not be what they want. They want to they might want to live longer or whatever it is. And taking that into consideration may change some of how you think about when a drug gets approved or not. And what the act does do is to m manage a, a craft a way for that to be included more often and to sort of have that be part of the conversation. And it can't just be about improving, you know, a one month survival. Maybe that's not good enough, maybe, or th three months of disease free survival or whatever it is. When patients start talking about their own diseases and how they experience it, that should also drive what then becomes approved and not approved. So we're closing in on the end of the session. I'd like to ask each of you to identify a particular um, policy takeaway, let's call it, uh, or recommend a policy takeaway from the Cures Act and our discussion today. Aaron, we'd like to start. Um, sure. So, I mean, I think that the, uh, the Cures Act uh, has a number of, of positive things in it and a number of negative things in it. And, uh, you know, I think that it, at some, at, you know, in the short term, at least, it, it'll come down to the implementation of it. Um, and so we really need to ensure that the uh, leadership at FDA is, um, you know, that the, the people in charge there will continue to have the same um, respect for science um, and respect for data and respect for research um, that that we've seen uh, that we've we've come to get used to, um, and so I think that that's going to be in the short term at least a really important um, thing to keep aware of. Pam. Yeah. Uh, so what I would add is, and I agree with that, that um, you know the Cures Act is meant to drive innovation and brings therapies to patients faster, and it addresses NIH and, and gives some improvements on that, and then it also streamlines the FDA processes to a certain degree. But the, there is 12 to 10 years of work before or in between there from NIH before, until it gets to FDA. And there's a lot that can be done there as well. And the Cures Act is not fixing FDA is not necessarily going to magically fix everything. Sure. So I would hope that the administration can appoint uh, wise people to run the NIH. 
uh, and the FDA. And, well, yeah, I'm talking about research, but I think wise people to run the NIH and the FDA. Uh, there's, in any of these acts, there's a lot of room for interpretation of what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. Uh, and we want people to understand that research represents the basic understanding that we need to be able to develop new diagnostics and new therapeutics that we can take to patients because we believe we're going to make a difference. And so that we have to give the, those administrators the freedom to be able to make the choices that are going to advance that agenda. And what I would hope is that we can find people who are willing to work in these unusual circumstances that we find ourselves in uh, to keep that particular mission right on target. Otis? You know, the historian George Santayana once said, those who do not appreciate history are destined to repeat it. Uh, that's true of medicine and medical history as well. We have in the past harmed people with drugs, harmed people with surgical procedures, harmed people with devices that were brought forth too quickly without adequate evaluation. Uh, I hope that we don't do that in the future. I fear, however, that we will. Uh, we have to uh, realize that there can be harm, realize that we can fool ourselves into thinking that we're benefiting people when we're not, and we have to have rigorous scientific criteria and rigorous evaluation of the data. And then once we approve something, we have to go back and continue reevaluating the data to make sure that we haven't made a mistake. Well, on that note, Thank you all for your insights. We really appreciate it. Um, I want to thank everybody for tuning in today and for attending today. I hope you found it informative and useful. Uh, you can continue the conversation, by the way, on the forum website, which is forumhsph.org. And we have another forum coming up on March 24th, Marijuana Legalization, the Latest Scientific Findings. That should be interesting from 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time at forumhsph.org. Again, thanks, everybody. Thanks to the panelists. Have a nice day. If you are interested in supporting this program and others like this from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, please call 617-432-1318 for further information.